Welcome. This video is going to break down Mother Any Distance by Simon Armitage. The poem's included in the Love and Relationship Collection for AQA English Lit, but it's an interesting poem in its own right. I'm here to show you the crucial information that you need for the poem, and then I'm going to show you what you can do with this information to make sure it stays in the long-term memory. This particular poem would be my go-to poem for the comparison if the question were anything to do with growing up, family, or changing relationships. If you want more details on how we're learning, this is the short version, so check out my video on When We Two Parted or Sonnet 29. The headings you see here are organised so that you can easily compare aspects of poetry and hit all of the criteria you need in the exam. This allows you to learn and revise the feelings of a particular poem to compare it with the feelings in another poem. The same for the endings and all the rest. It doesn't make sense to learn it any other way. As always, you can use these headings to make a mind map, and if you do, you can use a template like this. There are more details on how to learn at the end in the next steps section, including information about flashcards and crucially, what to put on them if you want to really secure that information. Content, tone and type. The poem is a narrative poem exploring the moment of leaving home. The speaker has moved into a new place and mum has come round to help him sort the place out. They start measuring the windows and he takes the end of the tape and goes up the stairs where he finds a dormer of Alex's window and he pauses there just before he takes a step outside. It's essentially all a metaphor for growing up and we often use expressions like leaving the nest, flying the nest, flying the coop, to talk about times like this in our lives. The tone of the poem is largely comforting. It's fun, it's slightly apprehensive at the same time. Mum is there for support, but growing up and becoming independent can always be a little bit scary. This is a narrative poem, but it feels like a lyric poem, a personal story. The poem comes from a collection Armitage wrote in the 1990s called Book of Matches, the idea behind the collection was a party game where you would light a match and speak and try to say something that revealed what you were like before the match burnt out or burnt your fingers. Think of the poem as a snapshot then, a quick fragment of someone's life. But that quick fragment is a point we all go through. It's a moment of life, a stepping stone that everyone experiences. I'm assuming you've read the poem, so let's jump straight into analysing it. The first word, mother, tells us that the poem is addressed to her. With that in mind, the poem takes on a kind of sharing moment with her. This is how it feels to be me right now. It's quite personal, and that means we have insight into someone else's relationship. There's distance in the word mother. It's full of formality rather than the closeness of mum or whatever else you call her. When I talk about this in class... We, we often go around the room and share the name that we have for our mums. Most people have a soft name like mum or ma, but often we use a formal name like mother, quite often as a joke when we want to pretend to be more formal than we really are, like when we say things like, mother, could you pass the salt? Oh, you are, dear. And that could be what's happening here. Armitage could be using a mock formality to reveal his closeness, or... It could be that he just uses the word because there's a growing distance between them. He's moving out. I don't think it conveys a cold relationship. It's just a nice way of signposting the change. Let's now think about the end. When we think about the endings, we're considering what it is the poet wants to leave resonating with the reader. We get an image of a man standing at a hatch to Felix's window and he says, I reach towards a hatch that opens on an endless sky to fall or fly. This is ambiguous, which is an interesting point of comparison for many other poems. What are we supposed to think? Well, I don't take it that he is genuinely at the window taking a step into the unknown and could fall or fly. Gravity has a nasty effect in these kinds of situations. Instead, think of it as a metaphor for being at a crossroads in life and not being sure of the outcome. The ambiguity of the line then to fall or fly conveys the apprehension that the speaker feels, uncertain of the outcome. Failure is a possibility in life, and this is acknowledged by the word fall, but the poem literally ends on the antithesis of that with fly. The other positive tone is in the preceding line, which contains the phrase endless sky. The speaker is looking at the wide world to be explored, an idea that we'll come back to when we explore the imagery. This is a positive image, though, a feeling of freedom and limitless potential at this point in his life. 
performance structure. I've often heard it said that this poem is an adapted sonnet or uses a sonnet-like form. I can see why people say that. It's 15 lines long, which is nearly the 14 lines of a sonnet, and the last line is really short. The benefit of this line of thought is that it allows you to say that sonnets are love poems, and he uses the form because he clearly loves his mum, and I'd agree with that. However, you can also see the poem as symbolically changing in structure as it goes on. The first quatrain, first four lines, are highly organised, having an A-A-B-B rhyming scheme, which we could interpret as reflecting life before the move, ordered and predictable. Looking more closely at the rhyme, span and hands a half rhyme, suggesting that order has already begun to break down. The second stanza has the appearance of structure, but it's actually free verse, having no rhyme or no identifiable rhythm. The final stanza looks like free verse, but actually hides internal rhymes that keep it flowing and keep it together. So, if we piece together that, take a step back, we can see that rhyme is obvious and clear at the start. It becomes lost in the middle, but returns, new formed and partially hidden at the end. Our job is to find a way to interpret that. So, the thinking shifts to what it could symbolise, what rhyme could symbolise in the poem. And I would argue that it represents their love, their relationship, which starts with clear order and structure, but that changes as he gets older and moves out. But it's still there. Their love is less obviously external, but more internal by the end of the poem. Main image. This is the bit where we talk about the image that you'd kick yourself if you forgot. This poem uses an extended metaphor of umbilical images, perhaps best encapsulated by the fragments at the end of the second stanza. Anchor. Kite. The brevity of the metaphor is powerful and reflects close relationships where you don't need to articulate every single thing. You understand each other and it's worth remembering that he's addressing this to his mum. She is the anchor, keeping him safe, stopping him from drifting off and being lost. You could also say that anchor has connotations of dragging him down or feeling that it's dragging him down. He's the kite. His job is to pull on the string. If he does not, the kite does not fly. So he's up in the air and she's on the ground. And that's metaphorically representing their two roles. But they are linked by a string, by a chain. And originally they were linked by the umbilical cord. And that image links back to the earlier spool of tape, which connects them both as he moves away from her through the new house. Now that is enough for an essay, but you might like to look through the poem and add a few details which I'll sketch out for you. He addresses his mother, observing you at the zero end, because she was there at the beginning of his time. He says, the line still feeding out, unreeling years between us, wrapping both time and space into a single object with a hint of the feeding that you might associate with a small baby. Let's think about the way the language represents the distance between them. Relationships are really about the metaphorical distance between people. So it's useful to look at how language shows the distance between the speaker and his mother. We've established that the tape measure is an extended metaphor for the umbilical cord, and he's moving further away from her as the poem progresses. But this poem deliberately uses distance to convey difference. When the speaker says, reporting metres, centimetres, back to base, he measures in metric, the more modern unit, she measures in imperial, as her fingertips still pinch the last one hundredth of an inch. She's the base, the foundation, the steady footing, but she has old ways and different values. The word pinch shows she's still holding on, even to the last degree, and that shows her love. He recognises that. The expression back to base, calls to mind a game of soldiers, a pretend play for children perhaps, with toy guns or toy soldiers. This ludic, playful nature is also seen when he says he spacewalks through the empty bedroom, suggesting the childlike imitation of walking on the moon with exaggerated steps, stimulating a sixth of the gravity of Earth and the elongated bounce as he walks. But it also conveys the idea of space. There's a whole 
universe out there for him to explore. Again, a symbol for his stage in life, as well as a reference to his earlier play. I would add that spacewalks are usually only conducted with an umbilical-like cable, providing oxygen to the astronaut to keep him alive and to stop him drifting off to a cold and lonely death in the void of space. And the world is a big place. Think back to the acres of the walls, the prairies of the floors. These examples suggest another small boy game of cowboys, as well as the vastness of the empty house he walks in. Think back to the house you grew up in, how much larger it seemed when you were small, when your head was below the height of the banister. He is refinding this sense of exploration, of play, of excitement as he grows up. Let's consider how the language reveals the speaker's feelings about his mother. The first stanza reveals a lot. Mother, any distance greater than a single span requires a second pair of hands. You come to help me measure windows, pelmets, doors, the acres of the walls, the prairies of the floors. The opening image is a powerful one, arms outstretched and needing someone else. It implies a kind of hug, an openness and a vulnerability to someone. But it's also a practical image. A single person can't easily measure a large space on their own. You need somebody else to hold the other end of the tape. The formal tone of the first sentence melts in the second when he says to her, you come to help, and he requires her. The reader sees her as available when needed, not interfering or controlling. She provides stability and assistance, and he values that. Yet at the same time, he is exploring his own world, his new universe as he spacewalks, floating away from her. There is anxiety there. Something has to give, suggests there may be some pain to his independence, even if the vagueness of something deliberately ambiguous as who knows what the future has to hold and her still pinching that last one hundredth of an inch suggests not only will she carry on supporting him forever, she may carry on too much. Now stick around if you want to know how to turn that into some solid knowledge. Next steps. The best thing to do to get a picture of the whole poem is to create a mind map of it. Use the headings I've provided here and you'll have a six-pronged mind map, which is crucial to know in advance of starting a mind map as it's going to make spacing it out a whole bunch easier. I will always use the same heading, so you can keep making mind maps of the poems, keep the format the same, which is going to make comparing them a lot easier too. Please check out my video on creating mind maps if you're unsure how to make them. I've mocked up a template here though if you want to use it. If you're trying to learn quotations, and I really would for this poem, the most effective way is to get the individual bits of information on flashcards. I'm going to put the information on screen in a moment for what goes on each flashcard. And remember, they are two-sided, so that's why there are two columns. The cards need to be identified with the name of the poem, so you need to identify them in some way. I've put that in initials in the top corner. If you don't do that, you get confused when you add to the cards with quotations from other poems. The meaning side can be put in your own words if you wish, but don't use any of the same words as the quotation or term, or it will be too easy. I've worded the cards as having a desirable difficulty, a tiny bit of difficulty, so that when you turn them over, you can be precise about what you're learning. And if you don't get it 100%, remember you can't half know something. Making the flashcards is step one to learning them, so I'll link my video guide to making and using flashcards in the description. That gives you a guide to the lightness system, which concentrates your learning on the ones you don't know, so it's a really effective way of learning information quickly. I've used it to learn more stuff than I ever thought I could learn, so give it a go and you'll surprise yourself. I intend to do all the poems in this collection, so keep an eye out for the rest of them.
you made it all the way to the end well done thank you make use of your flashcards and i look forward to the next poem